Good morning. How you doing? Good, how are you? Andrew's that guy right there. In the blue shirt? In the brown shirt. My favorite of his work is the work he does with people who are otherwise invisible. His early work with people who were mentally ill and people who are homeless and otherwise disadvantaged, people who, oh, people who live on the streets, people we don't see. I know that when I was, oh, about 12 years old, my parents drove us through the Bowery in New York City. And my brother and brothers and I were taken in by these people who lived on the street, who slept on the street in daylight. And we were taken in by them. And our parents did what I suppose all parents did at that time, which is to say, oh, don't stare. It's not polite to stare. And I think messages like that, people became invisible. It wasn't what was meant. It wasn't as if they were saying, don't see them. But that's what really happens. In order to avoid staring, we don't see them all too often. Andrew sees them. I feel like Andrew's work is very relevant right now because he does a lot of work with the homeless and there's a definite problem with how the majority of people treat people with low income and he shines a spotlight on that. He takes pictures of aristocrats because they pay him a lot of money. So he takes photographs for his daily bread of people who have a lot of money and no want in their lives. And I, I suspect in a way that feels unbalanced to him. And so in all these projects, he goes out and looks for the other extreme. And the projects that are near and dear to his heart, he takes pictures of people who, whose life is full of want, whose life is, or at least lacking in all the opulence that the aristocrats' life have. Uh, and, there, and so there is, in this strange combination of extremes, a balance that Andrew uh, creates. You know, I can, I can look at something through a camera and, and choose just the right moment or have just the right moment choose me and, and, and click the shutter and somehow that image will reflect something that resonates with people when they look at it. So, uh, so there's that threefold kind of, uh, of perspective, you know, uh, what I see what the person saw that I was looking at and what the person sees that looks at the picture and somehow that connects the person that's looking at the picture with the person that I was making eye contact with when I was photographing. He captures that connection. It's as if he has God's own gaze. It's something like that. It's as if Andrew has God's own gaze. And when he looks at someone and captures that moment, we see that person the way God does, I can imagine. More and more and more, particularly in the last few years, when I look into the eyes of another human being, when I look into your eyes right now, I see God looking back at me. And that, 
that always unfailingly gives me a sense of joyfulness, you know, a sense of rightness, which makes all the other stuff of no consequence. You know, all the failures, all the goofiness, all the not fit in this, you know, that, that I tried to cure with drugs and alcohol long, long ago. You know, all that sense of inadequacy is just of no consequence. You know, as long as I, as long as I am maintaining that experience of connection, not, not, just a, not just talking about connection, but experiencing that deep sense of connection, then, then, it, then, then I become real somehow, more real than, than when I'm just sitting around daydreaming about myself. I suspect that we're seeing in Andrew's pictures what Andrew sees. And you really can't do that. You really can't completely be in someone else's shoes or, or see things from their vantage point. But, but somehow, uh, master photographers allow you a different vantage point. And it's funny because I've been behind the camera uh, that Andrew is behind in the same, you know, just moments later in the same light in the same place, and you know, I'm, I'm I just, it's he is able to catch capture things in the finished product that is a reflection of the beauty that is actually there. When I was studying with Andrew, he was showing me how to navigate through uh, software called Lightroom. And I went to Andrew's and he shot a few pictures of me and I went with my grandmother. He shot a few pictures of me and my grandmother and then he let me take over and shoot pictures of my grandmother. And uh, it was much more challenging than he makes it seem. Because I, I think I took 200 photos. I took a, a ton of photos. And I think I got three that were I mean, they're not like Andrew worthy, but uh, <laughs> they weren't bad photos. You could definitely see uh, an emotion being conveyed. And when Andrew takes 30 photos, 20 of them are, are perfect. Ben is a real, he's a real special guy and he's changed a lot. He, you know, and, and, and become He's more and more confident of who he is. And that's fun to watch. Well, he tells stories a lot when he's taking pictures to get a reaction out of people. I've been photographed by Andrew quite a bit, and I've been photographed by a few other people, and the other people sort of just snap randomly. And Andrew, I mean, he'll tell a story or I'll have a conversation with you, and it'll sort of force a, a reaction. And it might not be the reaction he thinks, it'll just be a reaction. And those natural reactions are, are where you find the humanity in his, in his photos. I've known Pat Hall for a while. Pat Hall is a really amazing guy. He's a, he's a psychologist that works for hospice now. Uh, I've known him for about 20 years, I think. He, uh, I see him probably four or five times a week. Uh, have breakfast with him pretty often. He's, uh, he's a deeply insightful man. He's a big teddy bear of a man. You can always get a, 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 guy, a good guy hug, you know. His art, like his friendship, being one of Andrew's close personal friends, um, you know, the greatest thing about Andrew's friendship, and I think it comes through in his art to people who don't even know him, is he, if you spend more than 30 minutes with Andrew, you want to go do what you do. He just makes you want to, to go do what your skill is. Uh, which I think all really good artists do when, you, when, you, when you're in the presence of good artists and, and, or their art. I've got to tell you, there is a photograph he took of my mother and me, and it was taken 34 years ago. And I remember right now how I felt when the shutter clicked on that one 
photograph. There were many photographs that afternoon. My mother was traveling cross country. At just a few days, Andrew was filming the Fayetteville Townsport portfolio. My mother and I went in there. Now we had not been close. We could not remember being close as a mother and daughter. So why we wanted our photographs taken, I don't know, but we did. We showed up that afternoon, hot afternoon. And Andrew began clicking our picture. He took dozens of pictures and he finally said, can't you two get any closer? Because we weren't touching. No. Can't you two get any closer? Well, I remember touching, it was, she was here, touching, and that was it. <laughs> and he, he kept taking pictures. And he finally said this, he said, let, let me help you, let me help you. So he had me lean so that our head were literally touching. And in that moment, the only way I could tolerate that moment was to focus intently on Andrew's own eyes. I leaned into him with such trust. I poured myself to the trust I had with him. I remember that. What he did with that, all the photos were taken. He said, this is the one. He said, forget the others. This is the one. And I looked at that one and I saw something that was true that I had never seen for myself. I saw a connection with my mother and I felt it. And she and I both began to live into the relationship that he captured that we had never known. And I cherish my mother. And we have become the two women in that photograph. It's a great photograph of Suzanne and her, and it's, and her mother, you know, as, as two people. And the, difference in their ages, the difference in the places where they are in their lives, the difference in the way that they, and yet the deep bond and the deep sense of connection and, and all of us sharing that moment together. And you get all that emotional, you get all that, all that emotional stuff, all that human interaction stuff. And, and then you've got all the, this incredible, it's a white background shot, so you get all this light just coming from everywhere and it's a, it's a soft light, but it has enough sharpness to it to delineate surfaces. So, so it's like, from an abstract point of view, it's a fascinating uh, uh, collection of black and white tonalities and edge relationships. The, the best photographs for me are the ones that are doing more than one thing at the same time. So I realized that there was a significant percentage of our population who will never have a job, who are not going to get fixed. So it became the $20 bill project. And what I do is I big $20 bills off my friends that, that have, a, you know, a, a, probably have several of them in their pocket at any given time and they're not going to miss one or two. I mean, every time he goes and does these projects, he's like, hey, you got 20 bucks for my project? You got 20 bucks for my project? And he's begging from everybody I know. And then I, I go to the community meals and I set up at the, at the uh, far end of the hall where it's relatively you know, unnoticeable and I'm behind a, a small backdrop that blocks off what I'm doing with the north light window. And, and, uh, and then I just go out and I say, uh, I go up to people and I say, uh, I'm taking pictures of people and I, I, and I pay $20 bills to, I pay you a $20 bill to participate. And a lot of the people say, nah, you know, but then enough of the people go, Gosh, twenty dollars. Because for these folks, a twenty dollars really changes the, the their experience for a day or two. And the guys that give me the twenty dollars bills don't even notice it's gone. That's the irony. Because it shines a spotlight on how we're all connected. 
on how some homeless man on the street is connected to a senator or how I'm connected to an 80 year old woman and it might not be so easy to, to say in words to describe but when you see his pictures you get that sense of being connected they're out there and the reason they're out there is because they suffer from various forms of mental illness and all those different forms of mental illness have as a symptom some form of paranoia and what pa what paranoia means is that is that you're afraid of other people and you're af enough afraid of other people so that when somebody tries to fix you or save you it's like let me the hell out of here it's like one of the, you know we think well we need more homeless shelters but what we do with the homeless shelter is we take a bunch of homeless people and we crowd them into the same room in bunk beds. Well, that's the last thing they want. What they're looking for is privacy. What they're looking for is to get away from the intrusive, uh, uh, you know, constantly in their face kind of uh, culture that, that reacts immediately with their paranoia. Their paranoia is saying, uh-uh, let me go. I'd rather sleep under a bridge. You know, I'd rather carry my possessions around in a duffel bag than have somebody in my face about it all the time because I just cannot tolerate that. And that, that, that the, the realization that there is a significant percentage of, population, of our population that are out there like that and that they're not getting any kind of reasonable help aside from, in most towns, there are churches where they can go and get a meal. And Fayetteville, I've talked to some of these guys and they say, well, Fayetteville is a great town for food. We can always find a f someplace that will give us something to eat. And we're talking about people that have nothing at all. They cannot go into a McDonald's and order a cheeseburger because they don't have the money to pay for it. So, so, uh, so if in Fayetteville, they can find a place to eat every day. There's one church or another that's going to give them something to eat. They say the cops are pretty good. They're not great, but they're pretty good. They more or less leave them alone. They don't hassle them too much but they got no place to sleep. They have no, no secure, safe place to sleep. So, uh, so I became, I mean, I, you know, I'm a photographer. What have I got? I accept the fact that these people cannot be fixed and cannot be saved, but I do not accept the fact that they can't be helped. You know, they can't be provided with a safe place to sleep, safe food to eat, uh, adequate medical care, access to information and, and, uh, and communication and some form of accessible transportation. It's like a, a person with an infected little toe. You know, it's like, you think, well, it's just my little toe, I don't have to worry about that. Well, it, you can die from an infected little toe. And, 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 as a, and, and because our society has a wounded part, a, a deeply wounded part that we're, not, that we're not interfacing with, to use a nice tech term, you know, that, that, that we're not making a connection with. And the reason we're not making a connection with them is because we fall prey to this whole strong independent, I'm a strong independent person, you know. So, so, there, so these other people which are, who are clearly not strong independent people, because they're out there on the street, my God, they smell bad, uh, the, 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 they must be innately different from me, right? They must be innately different from me because my God, look at me and look at them. Whoa. So that ex accepting the fact that these people are different from me just leaves us lost. What we have to experience, not know, but experience, is the fact that these people are not different from me, that they are the same as me, that they're me, except with, a, with an illness that causes them to be uh, unable to make a connection with mainstream institutions. And it's as simple as that, they have an illness, which causes them to be unable to connect with mainstream institutions. I was asking another mutual friend right after we were having coffee, how would you describe Andrew? Because I was thinking, yeah, eccentric, eclectic, I don't know, how do you describe it? somebody like Andrew? And, uh, the, the gentleman I was talking to, who's also in his inner circle, uh, said, compassionate. Well, Andrew overheard that. He was coming around the corner and, and he said, I hope you're not talking about me because I am not compassionate. And, uh, and I understand uh, both of their perspectives. Um, 
But the truth is, Andrew does compassion. He may not think of himself as compassionate, but he, his actions are compassionate. He, he, is a, he is a human verbiage. He is doing justice. He is doing love. He is doing kindness. He is doing fairness. Uh, in, and he doesn't always feel like that. That's, that's one of the wonderful things about getting to be his friend is that he, he does those things in spite of how he feels a lot of times. And that's um, very inspiring in a world that maybe doesn't make you feel like loving everybody or being fair or just or kind all the time. As a photographer, all I have to offer is a connect collection of photographs and some little prayers that I write to go with them that hopefully reflect that deep sense of connection that we were talking about before, where someone looks at the picture and instead of seeing someone who is innately different from them, they see someone who is obviously the same as them. That they feel that, they look into the eyes of that, of that image and they, and they feel some resonance with the eyes of the person that I photographed and that three-way connection is, is established. And I, you know, we say, well, this person has a gift. Well, it is a gift in the sense that it was given to them. They didn't make it up. They didn't make up being a photographer. Somebody gave it to me, you know? A lot of people gave it to me. And I'm not just talking about the God thing either. I mean, I'm talking about all the books that I read and all the people that said, oh, wow, look at that, and pointed to some little thing in a photograph that I hadn't noticed and that then I knew about. And, you know, it's like, oh, it's, it's, it's just like, if you're willing to show up and, and, and be given something, then maybe you'll end up having a gift. He captures something so authentic that it draws out an authentic response. And maybe that's what would be healing from age to age to age as his work goes on and on and on. There aren't that many opportunities in this world. There are too, far too few opportunities to, uh, to engage authentically with another human being. There are so many things that get in the way, but he strips all of those things. He doesn't exploit the other. When so many have, we all can think of artists who have. They're compelling, they're compelling artistic, but his is engaging. There's something about that reality, that, that truth of what is, um, that, and it really comes through in, in Andrew's special projects. No makeup, no special lighting, no preparation, just, you know, going out and finding people where they are in there, the only thing it reminds me of really is some of the pictures that some of the people took in the depression era of people in, uh, in, in, the, in the homeless camps and that kind of stuff where they, they were just doing the things they were doing and you just immediately felt like, these are real people, that could be me. That could be me. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just, it makes you realize if you have your mental health and you have your physical health and you have social well-being and all that stuff, that's probably grace. In 1976, I decided that I, what I wanted to do with the rest of my life was to create a collection of photographs of all the different kinds of people who are alive in the United States during the time that I lived here and to preserve that collection so that it could be available to people as individuals and, and to the community forever.